Hello everyone and welcome to episode 15 of Magic the Judging. And whilst on all of our previous episodes we've been focusing on uh, all sorts of sets of rules um, in the comprehensive rules document that would explain exactly how the game of Magic actually works, um, which is obviously equally important for, for judges and players. Um, and, and, you know, in amongst all the episodes I've done some nice recaps of judging banter judging situations I've been involved in um, over the last however many months it is I've been uh, doing these streams. We're going to take a, a, bit of a, a bit of a sideways step out of the realm of the comprehensive rules, and what we're going to talk about is judging philosophy, like why we do what we do, um, what guides us um, whilst we're trying to work out what the correct thing to do is in any judge situation that we get. Obviously, if, I mean, if someone calls a judge and goes, judge, how does this work? Then the correct ruling basically depends on um, what it is that they're asking about, like what cards are in play, um, what the rules actually are. And uh, occasionally, however, things come up that have got nothing to do with the rules of the game, but more to do with rules of a tournament. Um, there's a subtle difference. Essentially, if you were playing Magic at your kitchen table you would still play all the rules of the game exactly the same as they do up at the Pro Tour. Unless you fancy changing a few, of course. I'm not talking about house rules here. But if something went wrong in your magic game at your kitchen table, then how that would be dealt with, based uh, in comparison with how it would be dealt with in the finals of the Pro Tour, is very different. So one of the tools we have um, for uh, discussing what judges do at events is the Judging at Regular Rel document, or abbreviate JAR, just to just JAR. It's all in the JAR. All of our judge philosophy is in the JAR. Okay, I'm, I'm skipping slightly. Not all of our judge philosophy is in the JAR. In fact, it's just the guiding principles of how we deal with lower level events is in the JAR. Um, in order to explain what judging at regular means, I need to explain what regular means, and in contrast, what competitive and professional mean. For this stream, I'm not going to go into a competitive or professional philosophy. I'm going to go into regular philosophy. On the other hand, in future streams, I will be covering competitive and, uh, and professional policy, as brought to us by a, a beautifully titled Infraction Procedure Guide document, or known uh, collectively by judges as the IPG. And that's a topic for future streams, how we handle competitive tournaments. But the fact is that most Magic tournaments around the world aren't competitive, they're regular. Actually, probably most Magic matches aren't even sanctioned, but of those that are sanctioned, they probably run under regular rules enforcement level. So let's have a quick look at what that means. Um, I'm just going to take a brief break here to go, Hello, hello Mark Clive Young. I've got a guy from South Africa watching my stream. Yay! Woo! We, Mark and I have um, have lots of chats. We're trying to trying to get him up to up to level one so that he can rule South Africa or something like that. Actually, Savas, um, Savas, whose surname I'm not going to attempt to pronounce, um, uh, is a, a great guy who's uh, leading as a level three judge down in South Africa. Um, I, I got the chance to meet him while I was at Pro Tour Barcelona, and it was an absolutely fantastic experience. Really enjoyed that. Um, so it's awesome that uh, other South African judges are, are popping up. Um, especially, bizarrely, uh, we often refer to our judge region as like UK and Ireland. Um, in fact, we often forget Ireland and we just say the UK. And then someone corrects us and goes, oh, no, don't forget Ireland. Ireland's not part of the UK, but it is part of this region. But it turns out South Africa is part of our region as well. I don't entirely know how that works out. But it is the way it is, and we love having you guys on board. So thank you very much, Mark, for uh, tuning in. Hope you enjoy yourself. Okay, let's move on. Let's, let's get some actual work done. Um, if you were to look in the IPG, and for those of you uh, watching live, I'm just pasting a, a link to the version I'm looking at at least, which I hope is the most up-to-date one, um, and you look at section 1.1, it defines what rules enforcement level means, or REL, or just REL, as I'll refer to it for the rest of the stream. So REL is a means to communicate to the players and judges what expectations they can have of the event, in terms of rigidity of rules enforcement, well, that's a good word, rigidity, like it, um, technically correct play and procedures used. So how 
how hard a line are we going to take with you when you mess up? That's what rel is, really. The relevant event will increase based on prizes awarded and the distance a player might be expected to travel to get to the event. People who travel further are often more competitive. Like The reason they've travelled a long way is to get to a tournament. The reason they'll travel for a tournament is probably because they're offering decent prizes. Um, they're less likely, sorry, they're more likely to desire a precise adherence to the rules um, and procedures, and the relevant event should reflect this. This is actually quite important. I, if you imagine that you've only ever played with the same eight people in your local play group, let's say you always meet up around a friend's house, get around the table, have a bit of a boost draft, order in some pizza, have a bit of a night of it, get drunk at the same time or something, I don't know. Um, let's say that's the only magic you've ever played. And then you hear about this draft tournament that's happening miles away. And you go there and you realise that they do things quite a lot differently to how you do them. That wouldn't be a great experience. It wouldn't be a great experience for, for everyone involved. This is what the higher rules enforcement levels are about. Right? We like consistency. We want someone to be able to have the possibility of travelling a few hundred miles to get to a tournament and find out that actually... They play magic exactly the same way that I do down here. Um, somebody in the chat is going to tell me how many miles it is from the Isle of Wight to Scotland. Or more accurately, I suppose, from, let's say, Newport and the Isle of Wight to Edinburgh. That's the journey I took at the weekend to go and judge in a WMCQ. And I would judge a competitive tournament on the Isle of Wight exactly the same as I would judge a competitive tournament up in Edinburgh. What we do for fun on a Thursday night or whatever could be entirely different, however. So yes, the relevant event should reflect this. People travelling, big prizes, all of that forces the rules enforcement level up. The penalties that are in the IPG always take REL into account. Okay, So what you do based on rules enforcement level um, is already taken into account in the documents we've got. And I've now actually sparked an argument in chat as to exactly how far it is from the Isle of Wight to Edinburgh. I'm getting I'm getting conflicting results. And I, until there's a consensus, I'm not going to report it on the stream. Yeah, here we go. So, let's describe regular rel then. Regular is the lowest rules enforcement level that we have. Regular says, regular events are focused on fun and social aspects and not enforcement. Most tournaments are run at this level unless they offer sizable prizes or invitations. And when you think about it, when you think of most Magic tournaments, most Magic tournaments don't offer sizable prizes or invitations. If you think about any given season, um, and by season I'm saying, like I don't know, about, about three months of play, let's say, how many tournaments will happen whilst Abyssin Restored is out? Well, there's one Pro Tour. There'll be a handful of GPs. Kim could probably tell me exactly how many, because you're probably going to be at all of them, but... Um, let's say at most, I don't know, six GPs. Um, in any one country, um, we'll have, uh, for, for, for that season, maybe six PTQs in, in well, I was going to say England then, six PTQs in the UK. Um, we'll have a couple of things, um, we'll have a couple of things like game day that will be um, a competitive event, and we'll have a handful of Grand Prix trials in each store. And then every single store and playgroup that runs FNM in that time will be running at least 12 FNMs, uh, 15 FNMs or something, something along those lines in the season. So think of all those stores running all those FNMs. They're all at regular. Think of all the tournaments your store runs that isn't even FNM. It's just some other casual draft night or something. There's quite a lot of stores that will run Magic on two nights a week. Can't all be FNM. That's why... Most, but the serious majority of Magic tournaments are held at regular rail. And that is also a reason why the serious majority of judges are at level one. Because to become a level one judge, you need to understand how to judge at regular rules enforcement level. To become a level two, you need to know about competitive level. But you can actually totally ignore the competitive level of tournaments and do all of the... Um, uh, all of the learning you need to, to judge it regular, just within your store that you go to every week to play at anyway, and you can certify as a level one judge. Um, I had some guys prove that to me at the weekend as I was at the Scottish WMCQ. Um, I'll say it now, congratulations to Tim Allen and Stephen Murray, who both certified as level one. 
Well done, guys. Um, and I'm being told that I probably flew something along the lines of 450 miles to get from the Isle of Wight to Edinburgh to do that judging. There you go. Okay. Um, players are expected at, um, at, even at regular rules enforcement level, they are expected to know most of the game rules. They're pretty much expected to know how to play Magic. They might have heard of our policy, and they might have heard of a few things that are really bad, but they generally play in a fashion similar to the way they do at home. Players are still responsible for following the rules. We don't take that responsibility away from them, even at, rule, even at regular. But the focus is on education and sportsmanship over technically precise play. So it's kind of the don't be a dick rule, if you see what I mean. You won't get away with it at regular, especially as this might be uh, this might reasonably be expected to have some be somebody's first foray into tournament style magic. Um, at competitive, yeah, sure. If your first tournament is a PTQ, then yeah, well, we're not we're gonna have a bit of sympathy for you, but we're not gonna excuse you of needing to know the rules of the PTQ just because it was the first time you showed up. That's exactly because the first time you show up to a tournament, we really want that to be your FNM that or that kind of tournament. And that's what we will be forgiving for you. Um, though much of the philosophy still applies, regular rules enforcement levels are not the focus of the IPG. In fact, I'm pretty sure you don't, need, you don't even need to read the IPG if you want to become a level one judge. Um, you don't need the IPG knowledge. It's quite a big document. It's quite a daunting document. It's not as daunting as comprehensive rules themselves. But anyway... Um, the judging at regular rail document should be used instead. That's what we're going to go on to. I'll very briefly give you a, an idea of the, the kind of the opposite of regular. We've got two other levels, they're competitive and they're professional. So here we go, competitive. Competitive events are usually those with significant cash prizes or invitations awarded to professional events. I mean, professional events, basically that's the pro tour. Invite to a pro tour, that's PTQ. Um, players are expected to know the game rules not to a technically detailed level, in that there are still things we expect them to get wrong, but we expect them to be familiar with policies and procedures. Unintentional errors aren't punished so severely, but there are events that protect the interests of all players by providing event integrity and also recognising that not all players are intimately familiar with the professional level event structure, proper procedures and rules. So there's a small amount of forgiveness in there, but generally we're sticking closer to the line. At professional, professional level events, they offer large cash awards. They offer prestige. They offer the, uh, the, the, the kudos of being the world's champion or like on, on the, the winning team of the World Magic Cup or the, a pro tour winner. Um, other benefits that draw players from great distances. And I mean, seriously, a pro tour has got players from all over the world. These events hold players to a, a particularly high standard of behaviour and technical correct uh, play. Higher standard of behaviour and technically correct play than competitive events do. An example of that, um, you might have heard about the Cavern of Souls ruling at the Pro Tour. We ruled that you had to announce you were using the Cavern of Souls uh, uncounterable ability in order to cast a spell and have it be uncounterable. We can do that at the Pro Tour because we expect you to be able to be clear and precise and accurate about what you're doing. Uh, we then later decided that actually, in general, that rule maybe wasn't the best way to go about things. But it's still, I believe, absolutely the correct decision to take at the time was that we our policy doesn't cover this so well, so we're going to err on the side of players be clear, players be accurate. It was professional rules enforcement level. Speaking of the Pro Tour, um, Pro Tour Barcelona was the subject of uh, Walk the Plains episode three. Was it, is it Walk the Planes or is it Walking the Planes? I don't know. It's one of those two. Uh, it's featured on magicthegathering.com today, I believe. Um, and I'm particularly interested in it because I'm in it. You'll, you'll see me, a little bit more beard, quite a lot more beard, actually, if I'm honest. You'll see me uh, making a ruling about uh, Ravager of the Fells, I believe. It's good fun, anyway. So, <laughs> moving on. I'm being told, actually, it's a hell of a lot more beard. It's probably true. You could, you could stuff a cushion with, when I have the... The whole shave done. Anyway, so rules enforcement level, REL, can be regular, competitive or professional. 
competitive and professional can tend to get lumped together because we don't really have different philosophies that govern them. Regular rail, some time ago, was hived off as its own completely separate thing and given the judging at regular rail document, which, if you're in the chat, I'm going to send you a link to now. If you're not in the chat, you're watching this uh, recorded after the event, then um, just Google for judging at regular rail or Google for the DCI document center um, and you'll see a whole bunch of documents that are useful for magic and one of them is called judging at regular rel. Okay. And again, if you ever hear judges refer to the jar, then this is what we're talking about. Um, I believe the MTG judge smartphone app has uh, the, the whole of the judging at regular rel document uh, and it, it's on the IPG tab, but it's there as chapter zero. Um, which is kind of not how it is on the web, but it's a perfectly good way to put it. Judging at regular rails, chapter zero of the IPG, if you like. Um, that's actually quite a good way to think of it in real life, as it were. It, it really is an introduction. Uh, it covers the philosophy of regular, um, and then you can stop there, and you have enough to be able to deal with judging at regular. Okay, I am going to be literally reading most of this document, because I can't improve it much further, to be completely honest. It's a very well written document. I love it. Um, please don't be tempted to fill in any gaps that you perceive in what I'm reading out. This really is the be all and end all of regular policy. Okay, so here we go. The vast majority of Magic players play for fun and enjoyment. I think we've covered this already from our definition of regular. They see a tournament as a social event. By running events at regular REL, we as judges can encourage this environment by curtailing certain behaviours whilst fostering others. For example, letting players chat during the booster draft is fine. That the, the competitive instinct in you is saying, players chatting in a booster draft, oh my god, the world will end. If you're thinking from a competitive um, angle, then yes, why would you let players talk in the middle of a draft? Like The, the event could be ruined by a, a simple leaking of strategic information or something along those lines. You could be distracting people by haranguing them or just talking about what card they should pick or something. At regular, well, let's say I, I played all my regular drafts. I actually played a vast majority of my tournaments um, in a pub. I'm, I'm having a drink. I am chatting with people about what they've done since the last time I saw them. Think about a, a regular draft. You sit down, you pay your money, you get your boosters, you start drafting. This is the first point in the evening that I've got to sit and chat to my friends. You're not going to keep me silent for half an hour whilst we draft. I, I want, to, I want to, um, to chat with people that I'm drafting with because they're my friends and I meet up with them each week. Um, for, <laughs> for, uh, for clarity, for people in the chat that are going, oh my God, you play magic in a bar? But like, this is when I was back in Bath. Now I'm on the Isle of Wight, we play in a coffee shop. Um, nothing happened to love coffee. It's still there. Um, however, even at regular rules enforcement level, we still draw a line, and that lines up to the point of giving strategy advice or discussing the draft itself. We still don't want people breaking those rules. This, this document defines these boundaries and helps you, as a judge, help your players have a nice fun event. Your players, in turn, they are expected to play correctly. I mean, they might be new, but they also might have been playing for years. Um, just because it, it's an F and N doesn't mean they're instantly idiots. So they are expected to play correctly, but Magic is a complicated game, and it's easy to make a mistake. Playing a spell without the correct resources is quite easy to do. Um, neglecting to take a mandatory action, um, most often this is going to be something that you were, that was supposed to trigger in your upkeep, and you just forgot because you didn't realise it was there. There's a Howling Mine on the table, and you just go untap, draw a card, cast a creature. Oh wait, I was supposed to draw two. Yeah. We can't protect players from playing badly. Like they, If they're going to play badly, they're going to play badly. We can't do anything about that. But we can do our best to fix the situation, and it's important that players know that when something does go wrong, calling a judge is the best course of action. And, I mean, th this is a theme throughout all the judging I do. Um, the main uh, push, when I make announcements at the beginning of a tournament, um, I tend to say something like this. If something goes wrong in your match, stick your hand up in the air and call for a judge. Shout, judge! Because, one, if you don't call a judge, they're going to get extremely bored because they'll be sat there doing nothing. Two, 
a judge has a, a, a built-in like drive to make the game fair, make it resolve correctly, make sure you're playing a proper, nice game of magic. On the other hand, if you try and sort out the, the problem that's happened with the player opposite you, that's probably not the best of ideas because they're trying to beat you. I mean, in a competitive tournament, that tends to sink in a bit better in FNM. That's not always the case. But We want judges to be seen as a very good thing at a tournament. We want players to turn up at a tournament, see there's a judge, and go, oh, good, there's a judge here. I like him or her. Um, they're, they're fantastic. I always have a great time when they're judging. Nice stuff. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. So... When you're called to a table, if you are a judge and you're called to a table at a regular tournament, ask some questions, and if you're confident the error is accidental, it'll usually be one of the small couple of types that are in this document. When you're delivering ruling, be sure about what you're delivering, or go and check the answer. Players will appreciate you being honest that you don't actually know off the top of your head what you're supposed to do right now. I'm just going to have to go and check. You go and check, and you make the best ruling you can. If you come across a situation that's not covered by this document, well, you just use your experience and your common sense to make the best drawing you can, and then find out an answer afterwards. And I actually believe that point is really important for lower level judges who are getting into the program. Um, there's a whole bunch of places you can make rulings from. Um, we've got, in the UK, we've got forums for judges to go to. Worldwide, there's a judge list that you can post things to. Um, there's IRC, which you can go on and be part of a chat room. Uh, it's a worldwide chat room that judges are on. The, you have resources available to you. The number of times as I was growing up as a judge that I would make a ruling in a, um, in a PTQ even. I'd make a ruling and I'd get home and I'd be thinking, I don't know if I did that right. That's, there's something bugging me about this still. I'd find it quite difficult to even go to sleep after the tournament. I'd be kind of wired and buzzing and going, what did I do? Um, I, need to, I need to get the right answer to this. And honestly, I believe that's what's made me the, you know, the judge I am today, that I, I will go and check things and I'll know for next time. And that's what experience is. Realising you didn't know something, finding it out and remembering it for next time. Um, remember that the head judge does have the last word, and after the head judge has given a ruling, players are expected to play on. Even if you haven't got a clue what ruling you're making, you make it, and they stick with it. Um, there's a direct link onto the IRC channel in DCI Family. If you know how to get to DCI Family, you can get to IRC. There we go. That's an easy way to get there. Beyond fixing the error that's happened at the table that you've been called to, it's also important to remind the players to play more carefully. Like I said, we can't prevent them playing badly, but we can try to help. You don't want to be heavy-handed because you want to keep your events fun and relaxed, but sometimes simply reminding players to be more careful won't be enough. This is sad, but it's true. A player who continues to make the same mistake despite repeated reminders needs to be warned that the next occurrence will earn them a game loss. Hopefully, this final step will not be required. And in fact, in my experience, I haven't even had to go that far. I haven't got to go as far as do this again, you'll get a game loss, right? Hopefully, the final step of the actual game loss won't be required, but knowing it is possible should get the player to correct their behaviour. As far as I've seen it, I, I've never seen someone at an FNM make the same mistake so many times I've had to get that far. I might have been lucky. Um, I, but then I, I have a tendency, if there's a newer player in the room, I tend to watch them a little bit more closely, and I can I try to help them out, um, especially like between matches. If I go, oh, you, seem a little, you seem a little bit unsure about how blah, blah, blah works in your deck. Uh, do you want me to go through it with you? Um, nothing in the judging at regular document has anything to do with deck lists. If your event requires deck lists, then it probably provides large prizes. It's otherwise of a more competitive nature. Just run the event at competitive rail, get competitive judges in, use the IPG, get past regular. It requ um, running at competitive requires the use of the full infraction procedure guide instead of the jar, as some rulings require more complex solutions. So, that said, as a nice introduction to how and why we judge at regular rules enforcement level, here are some common errors then. There aren't many, and you'll note that I'm not giving them specific names like we have in the IPG. I'm just describing something that can go wrong and how you can fix it. There's something like five different common errors that can be committed. 
Um, and so we've got five different ways to like fix the game to try and get everything back on uh, back on track. If it's not one of those, uh, yeah, if, if if something really doesn't fit any of these fixes, you can like try and make something up. But if you can just remember these five, then you'll be going a long way towards that level one pass. So common errors: a player's forgotten to take a required game action since the start of their last turn, so they haven't done something that they should have done. If the action was optional, and then assume they chose not to do it. You don't need any further fix than that. You just tell them, well, yep, I realise you've called the judge over because you missed this thing. The truth is, you have missed it. Try not to miss it again. Otherwise, you resolve the action now. Just do it right away. If several instances of an action have been forgotten, resolve any that have been missed this turn and any older instances are ignored. The uh, typical thing for this is... Um, you have a, you have a, a something that triggers in your upkeep, um, and you've forgotten to do that trigger. And then the next turn you forget it again. And then the next turn you remember it because of, I don't know why you have a sudden look over the board and think, "Oh my word, that's been there for ages, and I've completely forgotten about it." Well, we do the one that we, you 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 should do for this turn. The ones for the previous turns we don't go back and do. Older instances they're ignored. So there you go. If there was something you had to do. If it was optional, <laughs> but that's a bit of a contradiction in terms, isn't it? They've forgotten to take a required game action. If it was optional, to assume they chose not to do it. If it was really properly mandatory, it wasn't a May action, it was, it was actually a, a mandatory game action, then just do it as soon as you notice that it was missed, uh, as long as it was in, you know, in the turn. Players often do this one. A player accidentally flipped over a card while shuffling, or otherwise saw a card that they shouldn't have. Find out if any of the deck is known. I'll, I'll ask you now, come up with some examples in the chat. How could you possibly know where a card is legally in your deck? Um, I come up with two very common ones. Ponder is very common at the moment. Ponder will have you know um, the top two cards of your deck after you finish resolving it. Uh, any card with scry in it might have you uh, know what's on top or the bottom of uh, your library. You leave those where they are and then you shuffle the random bit. Um, so any of the cards that they shouldn't have seen and didn't know where they were get shuffled into the random part. If someone accidentally knocks over the top card of their library, but they already knew what it was because they just resolved to ponder and put it there, then we're going to leave it there. They've accidentally shown it to their opponent, but you know, whatever. That's their problem. Um, okay, third type of common error. Instead of drawing the correct amount of cards, they've accidentally drawn more. Determine how many extra cards have been drawn. Then take that many cards at random from the player's hand and replace them on top of the library. Or, if it was their opening hand, shuffle them back in. And then they can make mulligan decisions based on the new hand. Why the, um, why the uh, dichotomy? Is that the word I'm going for? Yeah. Why the dichotomy there? Why is it different if it's the start of the game versus not the start of the game? I'll, uh, I'll give you an example. If they've drawn too many cards in their opening hand, you can shuffle the extra ones away. Um, they won't know what's on top of their deck. And they make their mulligan decisions without having additional information that they shouldn't have. This seems great. This is fantastic. But let's say a player's got too many cards in their hand, no one particularly knows why, and we're going to take a random one away from them. Why not shuffle that one away? Why do we leave it on the top so that they know what's coming next? Here's the thing. Let's say I'm playing uh, M12 Limited, and I've got, I draw my opening hand and there's a fireball in it. And I play my whole game knowing I have a fireball. That every single strategic decision I make is because I've got a fireball in my hand. And then I manage to screw something up. I end up drawing two cards at one point um, instead of one. And you randomly take a, uh, a card out of my hand. And let's say you randomly take the fireball. Now, that's awkward that I now don't have the fireball for a bit. But I expected to swallow that because I made the mistake in the first place. I drew too many cards. Okay, my bad. I've lost the fireball for a bit. That's fine. But when we get to the next turn, and I draw a card, and I've got that fireball back in my hand, my hand has been restored, and exactly where I should have been, I haven't been overly penalised for the mistake I made. On the contrary, if you took that fireball away from me and shuffled it away somewhere else in my deck, you might have just completely invalidated the whole game I've just played, knowing I had a fireball in my hand. That's why the difference. 
players often make in-game errors that do not fit neatly into the three we've already mentioned. And this will be the bulk of them. It's very common for players to make mistakes during a game. Usually, we will just leave the game as it is. Like is. We'll explain to them what they should have done, but we'll just let them carry on how they are. We'll fix anything that's still illegal. So let's say you've taken a green enchantment and you put it on a creature that has protection from green. Sad face. You can't do that. You're not allowed to do that. And a couple of turns later, someone points it out. We're not going to fix the game, as in we're not going to do anything about, oh, your Birds of Paradise shouldn't have been able to attack for two because it had a plus two, plus two enchantment on it. Sorry, that happened last turn. We're not going to go and fix that now. But because it's still illegal for your Birds of Paradise to have your Blanchwood armor on it or whatever, um, with protection from green, I said the birds have protection from green, right? Yes. Yes, I did. I said they had protection from green. Um, we'll fix it now. You've got, you got your birds with your pro green and the armor falls off. If the error was caught pretty much straight away and rewinding the game back to the point where things went wrong is relatively easy to do, then go ahead, do that. See if you can go back to where it went wrong. So I've put a green enchantment on a pro green dude and I've attacked and you've declared a block, and then we've gone, wait, that shouldn't have been on there. Then we'll go, oh, okay, well, you did it in your pre-combat main phase, so we'll undo the block, we'll undo the attack, we'll take the enchantment off, we'll give you your mana back that you spent, because that was all totally illegal, we'll put the enchantment back in your hand. This is important. People intuitively come to a slightly different um, resolution of this. Sometimes they go, well, no, that was illegal, it needs to go in the graveyard. No, if we're rewinding, it goes back in the hand. Some people go, oh no, you couldn't put it on that creature, but you could have put it on that creature, so we're going to make you put it on that guy. We're going to make you put it on a legal target. No, we don't do that either. If you did it illegally, we just take it all back. Now, if you want to then go and cast enchantment on something else, you have got the resources and the ability to do so. That's your choice, but you're not forced to by any stretch. If you do choose to try to back up to the point where things went wrong, it is important you reverse everything, absolutely everything. Don't partially back up. If it's too complicated to back up all the way, don't back up. Pardon me. Don't back up at all. Final thing that's uh, quite a common error, but it's not an in-game error as such. It's when a player has an illegal card, insufficient cards, or another player's cards in their deck. Let's, have, let's see how we fix that. First of all, we remove any cards that shouldn't be there. Then replace any cards that should. If that still leaves them with uh, fewer cards in their deck than they need, they get some basic lands added in. If you discover this during a draw effect, so let's say um, you play pacifism on my guy, and then we shuffle up for game two, but I shuffled your pacifism into my deck, and I only noticed when I drew the pacifism. Well, first of all, we'll remove any cards that shouldn't be there, so we'll get rid of my pacifism, because it's not mine, it's yours. We'll replace any cards that should, well, I mean shuffling the pacifism into your library, um, but then, because we discovered this when I drew the pacifism, I'm essentially down a card because I, that, my cards disappeared. I drew a phantom card that disappeared. So I'm going to draw again. Additionally, recommend that players count their deck and cycle before they start a match. That's generally a good way to start a match. Okay, that's it. That's it for common errors. These are the things that go wrong all the time at regular rules enforcement level tournaments. And that's how you fix them. Done. Isn't that great? Isn't that easy? Don't you think you could you could take this document and just go into a regular tournament and just and do your judging? Get your judging bang on? It should be easy. I, I think so. And I, I love the way that this really does cover the philosophy of everything we try to do to make regular rules enforcement level fair and fun and, and all that. Now, if you do know about the IPG, you might think that something's missing here. I haven't said a single thing about giving players a warning with a capital W, the kind of thing that you write on score slips and get, enter into a Wizards event reporter. It's because the, the concept just doesn't exist at regular rules enforcement level. The closest we get is that idea earlier that if someone keeps making the same error and you get to a point where it's like, no, you really, you should have got this by now. Then you tell them, okay, the next time you do this will result in a game loss. But that's not a that's not a worth for warning. That's just a 
it's a I don't want to say caution either because that's a bit of an overloaded term it, it's just a bit of a mental slap it's look take this seriously gain loss next time it's an admonition angel um so yes <laughs> um that's yeah that's it we don't give out warnings we don't give out gain losses for penalties immediately either I, i've already given you the idea of somebody accidentally drew more cards and we fix it we don't give them a gain loss for drawing extra cards which is a phrase you might know from the ipg we fix it we know from other documents that we sometimes handle infractions different ways especially at, uh, at competitive um tournaments but at regular, I really want to drill this in. We don't give you a game loss ever for just doing something wrong. At worst, we'll tell you, stop doing this. It'll be a game loss next time. Okay. Now, there's, there's some exceptions to what I've said. There's always exceptions to what I've said. So let's move on to the next, um, next section. It's called general unwanted behaviours. So I, I won't bother filling in my own introduction. Again, I'll just read from the document. There will sometimes be issues. They don't have official fixes, but there's things that we just need to discourage players from doing. These include, but are not limited to, players taking unreasonable amounts of time sideboarding or making play decisions. You don't have infinite time, even at an FNM, especially at an FNM, by, uh, by my reckoning. So don't take it up by being really slow. Or searching for a card out of your library and then not really shuffling a deck afterwards or asking for or providing strategy advice during a tournament match or during the booster draft itself. In all of these cases, what you do is you educate the player on better behaviour. So if they didn't shuffle well, tell them ex explicitly how you expect them to shuffle. Um, explain to them the importance of allowing players to make their own decisions within a match whilst they're drafting. Um, players continuing to exhibit specific unwanted behaviour after being instructed otherwise, should be issued with a game loss. So again, if I'm drafting and some my player next to me, like it, he he he, no, sorry, a player next to me would be a bad example. But no, yeah, yeah, a player next to me, um, he passes me a pack and he goes, oh, you should definitely take the green uncommon from that pack or or something like that. Um, you need to tell them like, no, 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 this this isn't on, this isn't on, this carries on, you'll get a game loss. So the difference between like in-game errors, if you keep repeatedly making the same error, we'll eventually get to a point where we'll go, oh, you should have got this by now, it will be a game loss next time. This, you, you don't get lots of times, you get, oh, no, 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 no. this behaviour's out. We don't like this, don't do it again, please. Do it again, it's game loss. You see how that already feels a little bit more serious than an in-game error? It's, this is unwanted behaviour. It's not a mistake. It's, they've done something we don't like, but they're maybe not expected to have noticed, to have realised um, that they are not supposed to do this. Like, you should pick a, a green card from your next pack. Not everyone's going to realise that that's a bad thing. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Players arriving late to their game do deserve a special mention. Players that are more than 10 minutes late are considered to have forfeited their match. You can't have someone sit around forever waiting for their opponent to show up. 10 minutes in, yep, they've lost the match. Also deserving special mention, players engaging in conduct that you feel is likely to upset, offend, or affect the safety of others. Using foul language, tearing up cards, give them a stern chat about what's expected in your event or your store, if you are the store owner, and let them know that failure to curb this behaviour will be a serious problem. And that's a nice segue into the section on serious problems. There are certain behaviours that will not be tolerated in any event. Not even FM, not even in casual draft. You do this, you're out. I'll, before I introduce them, I'll just uh, refer to what I've heard called the grandmother rule. Your grandmother, almost certainly, I bet there's an exception, but your grandmother almost certainly doesn't know how to play Magic. They don't know anything about collectible card games. Fine. But there are certain things that if you do at a card game tournament and you told your gran about them, your gran would go, naughty, that's not on. That's really not on. What are you doing? If you break the grandmother rule, 
you're probably committing a serious problem. So let's, let's be specific. Any player engaging in the following behaviours must, must be disqualified from your event. Out. Get out. Aggressive, violent or abusive? Abusive behaviour, either physically or verbally. We're not going to take it. Get out. Actively cheating or lying or intentionally making illegal actions or trying to avoid penalties. Get out. Not doing that. Influencing match outcomes by bribing somebody, by bullying them into conceding to you, or using a random method, using a gambling method to work out the result of a match. Nope. Get out. Theft. This includes things like replacing a chase rare in a draft with one from your binder. It's theft. Get out. We don't want any of these happening. I am happy to say that I've never seen this happen at um, an FNM type event. I've never seen any of these things happen. But if you do have to hand out a disqualification, let the players know that whilst your decision is final, the DCI would still like to hear their side of the story. Contact your WPN representative and they'll advise you further. Um, if you don't know who your WPN representative is, and your tournament organiser will, that the store owner will, somebody will know hey, who's the guy in OP that they chat to. In the UK, it's likely to be Rick Powell or Tom Russell, but those kind of guys. The, you get in touch with them and they will advise you what you need to do next. And that's it. I have now covered the entirety of the Judging at Regular Rail document. There we go. That's it. Why do we judge? What are the common errors? What is really kind of unwanted behaviour that we need to tell people about and stop them doing? And what's a serious problem that will just result in you being told to get out? And that's it. So if you've got a level one judge test coming up soon, you should know that there will be questions on policy in it. And the policy questions are pretty much all out of this document. There is also the magic tournament rules, which has a couple of things, um, a couple of technical parts in there that you need to know about running tournaments. But the, the policy side of things is almost entirely covered with the judging a regular tournament. So... Here's some hints. If the question suggests that you give a player a warning, well, it's wrong. Warnings don't exist at regular rules enforcement level. If it suggests you give out a game loss straight away for the first time someone made a mistake, that answer is going to be wrong too. We educate them and we give them the game loss next time. If they do something absolutely abhorrent, like stealing a card, they don't get warnings. They're out straight away. You don't need a warning to tell you that theft is bad. Your grandmother knows that. You should too. Get out. Now, I'm exaggerating here. Well, I'm, I'm equating disqualifications with get out. And that's not quite true. You can disqualify someone from a tournament. And if you genuinely believe that they didn't know what it is they were doing wrong, you disqualify from the tournament, but you don't necessarily need to kick them out of the shop. If you've got another tournament happening in, a, in an hour's time or something, you can let them join that and say, look, okay, you're disqualified from this one, you can join in again. Some people use a tactic like they, they if someone turns up and they do something bad and they get disqualified, but they don't want that person to, to run away, they don't want that person to be gone, they actually would like their custom back in the shop again, they might do things like refund their event money. It costs you £10 to enter this draft, Look, give us the cards back, give you 10 quid back, we'll pretend all this never happened, come back next week, try again. That's really down to the TO. That's a TO kind of decision um, to make. If someone's exhibiting aggressive behaviour, I absolutely would get behind a TO that just banned that person from the store and said, look, I never want to see you in here again. That's also a TO decision, that's something for them to make. As a judge, you remove them from the tournament, Removed from the venue is something that it's it's not your decision to make. Cool. Hope we're clear there. Um, in the chat, let me know if you've got any questions about this stuff. Um, I will, uh, in the meantime, warble on about a couple of things. Um, let me have a think. I probably should uh, set up what I'm going to do next week, shouldn't I? Next week. I don't have any ideas. I think I'm probably going to be pressing forwards with uh, with policy by moving into the other documents. Let's let's see if I, I I'll cover the bits out of the MTR that you need to know. Um, I pretty much want to leave the IPG till last because the IPG's got 
nice big chunks of work to get through in and I can do like an entire stream on missed triggers. I can do an entire stream on uh, decklist problems, for instance. I can I can probably do that. Um, I can do an entire stream on cheating, probably. Uh, I might be a bit ambitious. I don't know. It's worth trying. Um, but uh, yeah, okay. Let's let's say I'm going to do the MTR next week. I'll knock off one more of the uh, policy documents. Oh, the MTR has got shortcut policy in it. You're absolutely correct. Maybe that's going to be too tricky to get by in one stream. Oh, I'll I'll have a look in it. Um, bum, 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 bum. Perhaps the watchers would be interested to know what, what. Talk to me, talk to me in the chat. No, okay. I think uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on then. Um, thank you very much all for listening to this one. Um, I'm just looking at my notes. These these are the notes I took. Um, this is pretty much everything that happened in WSM. WMCQ in uh, Edinburgh at the weekend. I'm just having a brief look over there to think uh, is there anything that um, that surprised me? Oh yeah, it's a couple of things that surprised me. I forgot until I looked it up and this is another thing I was saying earlier. Um, I forgot that the new play and draw rule applies at WMCQs. In the top eight, um, the player with the higher Swiss standings gets to choose whether to go first or not instead of um, rolling dice for it um, and it wasn't until I went and looked it up that I realised it was supposed to apply but um, having realised that I corrected my mistake and we, we actually played out the whole top whole of the top eight the correct way as it was somebody had asked me I think it was like near the end of round five they'd asked me are we using the new play and draw rule for the top eight and I said no um, I would have had to announce that in advance if we were using that rule because it's only used at pro tours and GPs and then I looked it up and went, oh, actually, it's Pro Tours and GPs and PTQs and WMCQs and this and this and this. So I know now. Um, what other kind of questions do we have? Um, someone asked, if I can, if I sum tighten an O-ring back into play, is that possi is it possible that I can uh, get rid of a from the last troll that way? Um, no. There, there are some tricks to do with bringing auras onto the battlefield without casting them that can get round um, hexproof because the aura still has to get attached to something but it doesn't technically target if it's not being cast as a spell. The thing is O-Ring, whilst it feels like an aura and often gets played quite a lot like an aura, it's not an aura so it doesn't work that way. The trigger ability is always targeted regardless of how O-Ring uh, enters the battlefield. Um, uh, can Phantasmal Image kill a hexproof legend? Yes, it absolutely can. Um, hexproof stops you being targeted again, but Phantasmal Image's copy effect isn't targeted, so it came into play. It became uh, Cigarda, I think, was the thing, and the angels died. That's what happens. Um, we had a, an amusing uh, communication problem where somebody uh, they said they said stay back to mean they weren't attacking, and then in their second main phase they said uh, land for the turn. And the opponent only heard the word turn and assumed he was passing the turn, so immediately went to play a vapor snag. And then the other guy was like, well, hang on, I'm in my main phase, so can I just replay the guy you've bounced? And we worked out what I did there was I just went back to the main phase. I took the vapor snag back and said, no, look, this just happened because you two are in completely complete disagreement of what part of the turn we're in. So we're going to go back to the point where we thought we were, which I think made the most sense there. That's about it. That's about all the interesting things that happened. Oh, there was actually a good one in the, in the final that was a um, little bit tricky, but you know, kind of okay. A um, guy sacrificed a ratchet bomb for zero, um, in killing all the tokens on the uh, other side of the battlefield. But he also had a germ equipped to a mortar pod. Um, and after he'd sacrificed the ratchet bomb, his opponent put all of his tokens into the graveyard. There was a bit of a pause. And then somebody, I think it was even one of the spectators behind me, said um, to me and the germ. Um, and I think the, the, the player activating the ratchet bomb had completely forgotten that his own germ would, would uh, be destroyed by the ratchet bomb. And he said, oh, I'll sacrifice it to the mortar pod to deal one damage to this thing over here. And I, I had to rule that, like, no, you can't do that. You've activated the ratchet bomb. It's resolved whilst technically you could activate the ratchet bomb and then respond with a sacrifice that would kind of require you to realize that was what you were trying to do 
Whereas it was quite clear that everybody around had, well, both players in the match um, had forgotten that the germ was there and also needed to be killed. So I ruled that no, you have resolved the ratchet bomb's ability. You just haven't put the germ in the graveyard yet. So no, not getting that uh, that activation in there. Well, I'm not seeing much in the way of questions coming through from the chat. So I will uh, end this week's stream. Again, I hope you've had fun watching and listening. Um, I hope you've learned something. Uh, or I hope if you haven't learned something, then you've thought of some other judges near you or some judge candidates that have been thinking about getting to level one and want to know about um, what judging at regular rules enforcement level is about. And you will refer to them back to this recording and they'll learn something. Awesome. See you again soon. Until then, have lots of fun. Cheers. Night-night.